Nicholas Bornholz of Capital Inc. We just finished uh, the uh, panel on the equity markets, raising equity uh, for global shipping. And now we are coming to the bond panel. Uh, the Norwegian bond market, a very vibrant, uh, innovative and flexible market that uh, offers capital raising solutions to domestic and international borrowers, uh, issuers. We have with us uh, a terrific panel of bankers and uh, international issuers. And I would like to thank everybody for being on board. And I will turn the floor over to Andreas, uh, partner at uh, Whitmore Ryan, who is going to moderate it. And I, I'd like to thank you all for the, uh, actually you guys have put in a tremendous amount of preparation for this panel and thank you so much. Andreas, the floor is yours. Thank you, Nicholas, and, and thanks to everyone joining us uh, here today. We have a, a great panel um, consisting of, uh, of a lot of people with, uh, with very much insight to, to, this, um, to this interesting market. Uh, so before we begin, let me give you a, a brief introduction to our panelists. We have uh, with us Alexander Just, who's head of uh, credit research at uh, Arctic Securities. Uh, Nils uh, Skogstad, who's head of Debt Capital Market at uh, Clarkson's uh, Plato Securities. Knut Eivind Holland, who is uh, managing, managing director and um, at the, uh, the DNB Markets uh, Investment Banking Division. Um, we also have with us uh, Per Leuvang, who is head of uh, Debt Credit Capital Markets at uh, Fernley Securities. And on the issuer side, we have Matt uh, Boris, from, um, who is uh, treasurer and head of uh, capital market at Atlas Corporation and has been involved in the, in the C-SPAN issuances, which we'll um, talk about uh, today. And we have with us Achilles uh, Tazioulas, who is CFO of, uh, of Gaslog. So uh, again, thank you for, to everyone for joining and to the panelists for joining. Um, We'll, we'll talk about the Norwegian bond market, uh, which um, most of you who are joining probably will know have been a, a very active market for, um, for uh, corporate issuers within the shipping industry for, for decades. And um, compared to 2019 and 2020, 2021 has been a quite active uh, year for shipping bonds uh, despite the, the pandemic. So, so let's, um, let's start off by... Um, by hearing from from Nils, uh, how, um, how how did the pandemic uh, impact the um, the market, and, and what's the current status of um, of it? Well, thanks, Andreas. Um, I think um, it's definitely been an uh, interesting and uh, quite remarkable uh, fourteen months uh, since the pandemic pandemic broke out. Um, it's been a remarkable rebound. Uh, and since the, basically there were sell-offs since the financial crisis. Um, to 2019, in terms of volume, was pretty low, and that was probably back on uh, quite a lot of issue volume in, in uh, 17 and 18. Uh, 2020 started uh, well, and then the pandemic hit, and we had a complete market freeze um, and the fund outflow. The big difference this time around compared to the financial crisis is that, that the policymakers uh, and Fed in the US were very uh, quick to respond to very aggressive measures to stabilize the market. And uh, with that, the, uh, the, uh, the market uh, calmed down, the, uh, the, uh, the fund inflow came back uh, and the remaining of 2020, uh, I mean, it basically started off with uh, the uh, issues of Stolt Nielsen and uh, American shipping in mid-June. And then after that, the market was uh, fairly active for the remaining uh, part of the year and into 2021 20, uh, so far. So, um, and where we are now, it's been strengthening uh, throughout that period. And now we are currently at a period where uh, the market is highly favorable uh, for new offerings. And we see, you know, attractive spreads and uh, a good market for new issues. That sounds... Uh... Sounds basically encouraging for for everyone. Um, Alexander, you you uh, you speak with uh, investors on, on a daily basis. Um, how do you uh, how do they perceive the uh, the current market uh, situation for, for, for from sort of a shipping shipping investor perspective? Uh, so 
shipping interest is probably the strongest I've seen in uh, several years. Uh, I'm just judging that by the amount of incoming calls that you get. And also when, when you, of course, look at the uh, credit spreads. Uh, shipping months, if we turn back to so Q420, if there were quite a few concerns in the market, uh, namely because investors had, had started to look at uh, ESG and, uh, and uh, were quite scared about how this would impact shipping. Uh, but um, uh, that has uh, been uh, resolved uh, with really the issuance of sustainable, sustainability linked bonds. Uh, so that uh, bond issuance, the first one with Oddfield that uh, Knut Eivind would talk more about, that reduced perceived refinancing concerns from the investor side uh, with regards to sort of ESG related issues. And then the focus changed back to, to fundamentals where, uh, you know, we are seeing uh, record low order books in many sectors and uh, shipping rates have uh, rebounded in others. Uh, and that has really created quite a rally. Uh, shipping months on average have tightened 260 basis points uh, since January. It's 10% tighter uh, credit spreads now than during 2017 to 2019. Uh, and and uh, the investor appetite seems to be, be growing stronger every day. So uh, it looks extremely strong. Very well. I, I, you know, you mentioned the ESG and uh, and sustainability linked uh, bonds. Knut Evin, um, there has been some quite quite interesting deals in the market uh, this year. Um, could you give us a little bit of a of a flavor of uh, of of the the market today and 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 the recent deals that have been done? Absolutely. Thanks, Andreas. So I think the. Um... As we, as uh, was mentioned by Nelson and Alexander as well, ESG has, uh, has been a strong trend over the past few years, really. Um, and and I think you know, in, in terms of shipping, it's been a little bit on and off, really, the market sentiment up until recently. We've seen, um, as mentioned, the the obviously it helps a lot with strong shipping markets across most segments, uh, combined with I would say record low yields and a lot of liquidity in the market. Then what uh, has been the recent trend is, uh, as you said, the sustainability linked bonds, uh, bond structures that fit, uh, fit uh, shipping companies, I think, pretty well. Um, it's not linked to use of proceeds as such, but to um, call it the corporate and, and some targets in terms of moving in, the, in a more sustainable direction. Um, that's been a big investor focus, as, uh, as mentioned. Um, Oddfjell was the first one out in, in January, um, very successful deal, um, well received uh, across the board really, that, that was a knock the nominated deal, so mainly Nordic investors, followed by C-SPAN just a few days uh, later with, the, with the, uh, also you know first time issue in, in the market, but, but very well received, um, both a Nordic and global investor base, uh, slightly different type of um, uh, of KPIs and targets uh, from a sustainability point of view, but again, and I think that's really the key. You, you need to set up the structure, uh, sustainability structure, the framework, the targets to to match your uh, business, match the the, um, the business model. Um, and I think the, the feedback from the investors were again very very good. Um, it, it's certainly a product in the making, I would say, and and there will be. Updates and changes, but but and I, but I think the general investor feedback, which I think is a good one, is that every company can do something, and um, we um, acknowledge that that it's a transition period for for other companies. It's not like black and white. You can't you know change your business uh, overnight to a sort of clean uh, you know renewable type of a green business. Um, but um, um, every sort of measure counts, and um, you know, to, to have that top of the agenda is, is really important for investors, and, and hence important for the issuers as well. Later, we saw C-SPAN coming to the market again um, with a with a larger, even larger deal, three hundred million dollars, a longer tenure, tied to pricing, and we also saw SFL Corporation uh, doing their first uh, sustainable link bond. So th this is. 
definitely something that um, will continue. Um, it's a product in the making. There will be probably new uh, call it features and adjustments to framework and KPIs and what have you, but it's certainly something that, um, uh, you know, and, and this is not only shipping, it's uh, across all, all sectors, um, but obviously combined with the uh, generally strong uh, shipping fundamentals uh, these days, I think that's um, something we will see more of. Yeah, it's um, you know the the combination of uh, of the need to do uh, things on the ESG side and shipping and uh, the fundamentals in the market and also the development on the bond side is is quite interesting. And as you say, it's a product in the making, so so it will be interesting to follow. Pierre, you you have also um, been involved in these these uh, some of these recent deals. A anything to add from what uh, Knut Evin uh, said from your perspective? Well, I think I can just basically confirm that there is a really good uh, sentiment for shipping companies to, to utilize the, the bond market. There's been a tremendous shift in appetite after kind of vaccines became available for Christmas last year. Um, people are back into cyclicals. Uh, and this uh, sustainability linked product makes, uh, which, which shipping companies can utilize kind of as opposed to green bonds, which has been more predominant uh, previously. This is... Um, better suited for the shipping industry. And uh, I think there's been some really good examples uh, of that, including C-SPAN, which, we'll, which Matt will explain more in detail about uh, later. And if I can add one more point, uh, in terms of funding costs, we are now at a considerably lower funding cost than we were uh, pre-COVID, because the underlying interest rates are, are much lower than they were at that point in time. So it's, it's a good market to, uh, to, um, to utilize for funding. Good. I, I um, will get back to, to talk uh, a little bit more in detail about the ESG and sustainability link um, uh, trends uh, later on. Um, but, um, but before we do that, let, let's talk a bit about sort of the, the market in general. We heard uh, good news in the sense that uh, the market is, is very much open to, to shipping deals. So that is, uh, that's positive. Um, the, the market in, in general has, um, as we know, been, been perceived as an, an efficient market for issuing unrated bonds for specifically for, for shipping companies um, for, for a long time. And Matt, um, C-SPAN did two deals uh, quite, quite recently uh, as a new issuer in the, in the market. So um, that's, that's quite interesting. And, and could you give us a little bit of, of insight into, into why you chose to, to come to the Norwegian high yield market? For sure. So we established uh, back in 2018, we established our objective uh, publicly and, and internally to achieve an investment grade credit rating. And since that time over the past few years, we've put some, some pretty significant work into reshaping our balance sheet and kind of evolving it um, forward making those, those step changes. Um, we then got to a point where uh, we, were, we were at the, the step we set out in our capital plan to shift uh, more of our capital structure towards unsecured, so from secured to, to an increasingly unsecured capital stack. Um, and the Nordic markets were a, a natural entry point for us. You've got a, a sophisticated shipping investor base uh, sophisticated shipping and shipping knowledgeable banks um, and the credit research provided in the market uh, to issuers is helpful, particularly for, for inaugural issuers to get um, some deep knowledge, some deep, deep uh, dive on the credit out to uh, potential investors um, and, and helps to kind of inform your, your potential market. We, we also wanted to enter in a, in a measured way um, and the Nordic markets best allow for that. So we were able to issue uh, an inaugural note with a shorter tenor uh, and a smaller size to minimize the pricing impact that first time issuers take um, and then take improved terms on subsequent issuances. As we did, um, our, our, our first issuance was in January. Our second was in, in April. So we were able to kind of make those step changes um, one over the other. And for us, it's, it's about kind of always being better than the last and, and not taking too big of a, a plunge um, too early. And, and what, do you, you know, what, do you, what do you think about the, um, 
the the flexibility of the market that's all often often highlighted as one of the real benefits with uh, with the with the Norwegian market um, flexibility in terms of, of various matters do, do you have any thoughts on on that in your experience yeah for sure so that was a that was a big benefit as well where we had flexibility regarding terms where say the uh, the US high yield markets would would typically have a um, rather fixed structure minimum minimum real size to to get in and, and size to get some some more substantial liquidity but the flexibility to construct our own uh, our own terms that that worked for us um, and have you know maintenance covenants that match our secured debt rather than moving uh, straight into incurrence covenants um, like the US high yield market would uh, would require was very helpful and then you know the flexibility as well on the um, the the markets that you can tap, we were able to. Our first issuance was um, a significant focus on or a significant base of uh, Scandinavian investors and and shipping knowledgeable investors, but still had uh, some good global reach. Then our second issuance, after we became you know a bit more known, we had a precedent out there, was uh, significantly more global. So you you go in and and get the advantage of of this shipping investor base, but then you also have the, the added benefit that there's a good global market um, between the US, Asia, rest of Europe, et cetera, that you're able to tap into um, to, to kind of broaden your reach. Yeah, and, and any, any do, you, do you have any ex- experience on the, on the repeat issuance compared to the, uh, com- to the first? Yeah, definitely, I think. Uh, the so the intention was with our first issue we wanted to um, working with our our partners at, at DNB and Fernley we we came up with a construct to to provide a an it was a three year note uh, provide an NC three so non call for life um, and the marketing was you know you're you're taking a a sort of not a chance with us on a for, on a on as an inaugural issuer but Kind of get to know us, and the reward is is significant in that you'll benefit from capital appreciation of the note over time, as we won't be calling it um, while we're kind of going through this this capital plan. Um, so our our uh, inaugural issuance was was a six and a half coupon three year. Three months later, our second issuance was a six and a half coupon five year, um, despite the treasury curve moving up. Uh, over those three months, so um, and then beyond the beyond the the pricing benefit, we also tapped some uh, a much broader global market uh, with the second, um, and people were able to look at the precedent from the first, get in, and I think that that will we expect that to kind of continue for us, and and each issuance will be better than the last. So so all in all, uh, it sounds like a very positive experience. Definitely, I think uh, I think it went exactly kind of according to plan. That's always good. So, so Achilles, you you uh, Gaslog have um, have been uh, present in the market for for some time. Um, you know, so so, and any other perspective? Uh, Matt Matt uh, gives us the uh, introduction from uh, from a, from a new issuer. But uh, from your perspective, uh, what are your thoughts on uh, on the um, on the Norwegian bond market for for shipping companies? Thanks, Andreas. So I would say that the experience has been uh, uh, similar and uh, indeed Cashlock is uh, well established in this market. Uh, we have been um, active in, um, in this market since our first offering in uh, uh, 2016. And uh, since that time, uh, you know, it has been, uh, our issues have been an integral part of the growth of our fleet to 35 vessels. So first time we have been in the market in uh, 2016, uh, with our first uh, uh, issuance in NOC. And uh, then we experienced something uh, quite interesting that uh, we issued a US bond and we realized that the, the Nordics uh, have been following us uh, in our US issuance uh, at a significant um, uh, amount. So 
Um, this market has been uh, very supportive and the investors um, um, you know, have been following Gaslo. Since then, we have, done, uh, we have been opportunistic doing the tap issuance, again, with uh, Nordings following us. And uh, we have also refinanced our original um, uh, issuance and upsizing it. So in this respect, I would say that it has been an important market for Gaslock. Uh, and uh, the investors have been uh, supportive uh, to our growth. And um, it provided us an alternative financing and gradually helped us access the US bond market, as I said. So um, there is an international um, uh, market with a broad set of investors, European and US investors, that they are able to follow you uh, once you are established uh, to other um, uh, issuances that you may do elsewhere. So you, you create an audience. Uh, so in this respect, I would agree with Matt and, and others that there are uh, significant advantages in this, um, in this market. It is a market that is very familiar with shipping. They understand shipping. Uh, it's organized. Uh, it has an uh, advanced analyst community that they can cover also your credit and uh, your equity as well. Uh, and they, the, there is a wide, um, uh, wide uh, you know, uh, community that provides all types of services from investment banking up to uh, brokers. Uh, it also works very well with the um, well-established uh, lending side. And uh, you have um, uh, key banks supporting you both on the lending side, but also on your uh, bond issuances. And uh, since we have the, the experience of being uh, listed in the New York Stock Exchange as well, at least until next week, <laughs> that we have the extraordinary voting. Um, it is quite efficient in terms of the documentation, quick execution, uh, and allows you to be opportunistic. So uh, when the market is there and the window is open, you have the ability to, to, to react fast and access the market. Uh, on the other hand, also the compliance requirements are uh, reasonable and you don't come up with the cost burden that you have uh, in the New York Stock Exchange uh, market. Obviously, on the other side, uh, there are things that uh, you need to take into consideration. Uh, you know, uh, the, the bond market, like all bond markets, are not always open. So there is a cyclicality that follows either the industry or the macroeconomic conditions. Um, the currency, uh, it is a bit tricky, but uh, of course you can do uh, hedging and uh, eliminate this risk. And um, I would say that uh, initially the size has not been, uh, 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 the sizes of the issuances have not been great, but uh, we have seen very recently uh, significant changes on this direction that makes it uh, a much more uh, established market. So definitely to summarize the, the experience has been positive. That's, um, it's good to hear that, uh, that you also you as, uh, as a, as a longer term participant in the market uh, have, have um, so many positive things to, to say about it and have had a, a positive experience. Um, so David, we, we've heard uh, the issuers uh, comment on, on, on a few um, things about the, the structure of the market in general and also comparing it to the US, which is, uh, which is of course natural. Do, do you have anything to, to add from sort of the, the, the investment bankers perspective in that respect to, to summarize the differences, uh, for example? Yeah, I, I would say really um, what the Nordic high yield market is about for shipping. It's, it's, uh, the, the way I um, tend to describe it it's, it, it's really a flexible and efficient platform for companies to raise debt. Um, as, as I think uh, outlined by, by Matt and Achilles as well, it's, a, it's not only a market where you, where you sell these bonds to Norwegian or Swedish or Nordic investors, it's really a global platform, or it's a platform for a global reach, uh, rather. Um, I think also the it's it's interesting because um, if you look at, um, at the two issues on the on the panel Gaslog and, and Atlas Cispan, um, 
you know, Atlas and C-SPAN is, a, is a, in this context, I would say, a, a really a large, um, or one of the largest uh, shipping companies in the world, independent listed shipping companies. Uh, Gaslog is a, is a long-term player in this market as well. But if you look at when, when Gaslog did the first deal, which I think is very interesting and, and a good example of, of the, call it the flexibility of this market, I think, and again, I could also correct me if I'm wrong, but I think at that time, in 2013 or 14, uh, you had like four ships on the water, uh, but you had a bunch of uh, top-notch latest technology new builds with long-term contracts. And really we got um, the that deal done successfully. Uh, it was a good entrance for Gaslag, I think, to the market. There's been a, a several deals uh, later on, including moving to the US with, uh, I think almost you know, 40, 50% of that uh, $250 million US documented deal taken up by Nordic investors at the time. Um, and it's just an example of the flexibility. We do uh, call it large corporation, uh, more standard uh, type of deals. We do smaller, more sort of bespoke uh, tailored deals uh, given the, 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 the situation and the, and, the, and the credit profile. Of course, over the years, we've done a lot of uh, secure deals, um, all kinds of uh, structure, which I think and why does this work in the in the Nordic market so well? I think it's really um, different things. But first of all, uh, knowledge about the sector. Um, the banks are knowledgeable, um, uh, lawyers and credit research analysts. And it, it's a good hub, really, for, for um, shipping and maritime industries. Um, but also, to some extent, uh, I would uh, it's a guesstimate from my side. But I think really the US market, banks and the setup, they do not really have the time or want to spend the time on call it smaller deals and more bespoke deals so just the bigger the better get it out on the sort of conveyor belt and push it out in the market and so i think when it comes to this um and you probably need you know three four hundred million dollar minimum deal size for for really the banks and, and some of the investors to 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 spend the time so there are a lot of components but i think um um, th th this has been very successfully over a decade or two now, basically, and and, and um, you know uh, it's it's a good market for a lot of different uh, call it uh, shipping companies and, and credit profile, whether you're a small um, uh, small setup or, or a big setup. Yeah, I I, I agree, and, and and would say um, Nils, uh, do you, do you have anything to add from um, from sort of your your perspective on this? I, I think I could dive in touch most of the points, uh, but but uh, I think it also shows, you know, with C-SPAN and, and uh, Gastog, uh, but there are also all these smaller issues. Uh, the Norwegian market for many issues or for the capital market as a whole has served uh, maybe a, a, a void or like a, an, a, a, like an, a, a source of financing that not necessarily is there uh, uh, elsewhere, given that you can do smaller sizes. Um, and I think that has been important for many companies to be able to access a market, despite it being you know, away from home, uh, with an educated investor base that knows the difference between commodity and industrial shipping, right? So, uh, and I think that, that, that position has stayed over the years where the Norwegian or Nordic market has continued to grow, but shipping as a portion of of that has stead, uh, been steady at between 15 to 20% of the total outstanding amount. And it's been growing also a year over year. So yes, um, it, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a market that uh, definitely is gonna be here and it's gonna serve a wide variety and increasing variety of uh, shipping uh, companies that, that, that need to access uh, the capital market. Yeah, definitely um, uh, a developing, um, developing market, but also also within the shipping, uh, shipping space. and. Um, um, let's um, let's touch on on one of the aspects that we've already um, already talked a, a little bit about, but which is it is definitely one of the key trends at the moment. So it's it's good to to spend some time on that, and that is of the the ESG and sustainability link uh, aspect. Um, Matt C-SPAN uh, decided to uh, to do a, a sustainability not, not one but but two sustainability linked uh, bonds. So so could you could you elaborate a bit on your thoughts behind uh, the rationale for for doing that? Definitely. So uh, at C-SPAN Atlas, we've got a pretty strong focus on, on ESG and kind of doing, doing things the right way. So we made a decision pretty early on to 
um, to engage in, in structuring a sustainability link bond. And from there, it was, it was, you know, what are the KPIs? How do we go down that path, et cetera? The additional work um, for the sustainability link kind of seems intimidating or may seem intimidating from the outside. But if your company has a, a focus on ESG, you probably have a lot of the work already kind of created and handy. Um, and from there, you, you go to structuring the, uh, the KPIs, which are the real, the part that takes a lot of thought and, and discussion and consideration um, and work with a, a second party opinion provider. We worked with Sustainalytics um, and our, our banking partners, but the, the KPIs are um, not to be taken lightly. They become public statements of intent um, and live as long as the bond does. And also, you know, of course have a, a pricing penalty if, if not achieved. Uh, so definitely need to be carefully thought out. And as we thought about our, uh, the appropriate KPIs for our business and, and it's different for everyone, um, we wanted to focus on emissions, but uh, which is kind of the go-to, but emissions are, are primarily driven uh, in, in container shipping by, or at least in our, in our business by two things, um, the vessel design itself, of course, and then the, the way it's driven. So, you know, primarily the speed at which the vessel is driven uh, is, a, is a significant contributor to um, where you're, you're going to be admitting. Um, given our business model where we, we operate our ships at the direction of our customers. Um, so our customers, you know, kind of determine how fast the vessel is to go from point A to point B, where we're limited in how we can directly control um, emissions on on that front on the in-place fleet. So the way we the way we set our KPI to to address this was um, based on capex spend toward alternative fuel solutions that that reduce carbon emissions. Um, and by doing this, it's sort of forcing allocation of capital toward transition or or solution technologies, um, and that puts achievement you know within our control and aligns our, our financials with our responsibility to the market. Um, from there, you know, the materials, there's, there's uh, several materials that need to be created and, and an annual ongoing audit of where you stand relative to your target. Um, and then when we got to, to launch, our experience in the market clearly showed the, um, we had a number of investors that, um, we're particularly interested in the sustainability link or, or the ESG aspect. So it definitely created more demand. I think the question that always comes up is what's the pricing benefit of, of going with a, a sustainability link or a green bond, whatever it might be. Um, and that's a, a tough one to answer um, because, you know, I think it's, it's pretty clear to us that it created more demand, um, but how that demand plays into pricing is a little more uncertain. Um, I think in, on, in our case, we decided to not try and push pricing as tight as possible. Again, kind of keeping with that, that step plan of we always want the next to be better than the last. And we want our investors to walk away happy um, to create that win-win that and keep some, some long-term partners. Um, but the, the entire process has been uh, what was a good one. And we've now... Um, from 2020, our first sustainability linked loan um, to you know, you know, now two sustainability linked bonds and, uh, and just recently a, a 2.5 billion sustainability linked facility. Um, I think that that linkage is pretty important for us. And for, for the market as a whole, I think it, it helps to shift the mindset of issuers, of lenders, of, of banks, of all parties um, toward, uh, you know, what is the right, what is the right thing for the company to do from an ESG perspective? So it brings it in front and center. Um, and I think that that has tangible short and long-term impacts. I think uh, the sustainability link bonds, that's a, that's a great invention that, uh, that works well for the shipping industry as it can be tailored to the specific uh, characteristics of, of each company. Uh, and uh, no, not all companies are as well prepared as, uh, as uh, C-SPAN, 
not everyone has had kind of sustainability plans in place for years. So we, so we get a lot of questions on kind of how can we put in place uh, KPIs and, and so on. Uh, so I, th I think this is, this is just the start of, um, of this market. There's going to be a, a lot uh, more sustainability linked bonds uh, going forward. Um, and I think, uh, but I think not, not every company is ready yet. Um, so the 12 months from now, 18 months from now, maybe this is the standard for, uh, for all companies. I wouldn't rule that out. Uh, what, what we experienced though is that um, the companies are very concerned about not meeting uh, the KPIs that, that, that are being put forward. So it needs to be well taught uh, uh, through, but, um, but I guess this is uh, it's going to develop with, with this market. And do you, do you think the, the the additional time it takes for you know to develop the uh, the KPIs and um, and 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 the rest of the sort of package that is needed for the for the sustainability link is that it, could you comment on on how time consuming that is in reality? Certainly, it, it adds uh, probably a couple of weeks to to a, a process, but uh, um, I guess. Uh, that's something that can be done in the in, in the in the background when you're planning a, an issue and you can can it's something you can have ready and in the case of the c-span from from the point in time where you decided to to go to market and we actually launched a deal that, that was just a matter of a few days so uh, uh i don't think that should be a constraint on any uh, any bond uh, transaction really and there are yeah. there is a lot of uh, very professional second party opinion providers out there now. Sustainability um, analytics was used for uh, for C-SPAN. There are a number of good Norwegian companies as well. So uh, there's a, there's a lot of good advice to be um, you can put you in connection with to to uh, to develop a similar framework or a framework that works for each individual company. Matt, you were you were saying. I, yeah, I think when when it when it came to uh, anecdotally uh, creating our KPIs through 2020, we we put in a, a significant amount of work with our projects and technologies team to to figure out what the future looks like. You know what we can promise. You don't want to come out with we don't want to come out and say we're going to be you know carbon neutral by 2050. We have we have you know no idea at this point in time. Um, so we wanted to to think about what is what's tangible what's actionable and as we started to understand all that a lot better um, the KPIs sort of dropped out or uh, kind of naturally flowed out of that and once you have a good once you have good a, a good conceptual understanding of, of what makes sense um, it, it's sort of easy to do and then if the if those KPIs work and and you know don't go wrong you can sort of rinse and repeat with subsequent issuances like we did with our, our January bond was a 200 million, a 200 million bond, 200 million CapEx target toward, um, you know, emit more uh, fuel efficient or emissions friendly technologies. Our April bond was also based on CapEx, 300 million bond, 300 million CapEx target. Um, and I think that that was well received. So you don't sort of need to reinvent the wheel every time with KPIs, depending on what you select. And do, do you think, uh, do you think the, um, um, you know, one thing is to develop KPIs and for, for a particular case, sustainability link point, but do you, th do you think this is something that will, will sort of be the ESG part of, of the business will just be, it will be a part of the way you do business anyway, in, in the future, like, um, we were talking um, 18 months from now or five years from now, you know, uh, that maybe this is part of how everyone operates. Yeah, I, I think so. It, it does definitely, as I mentioned, kind of bring it front and center in your, in, in your business's focus. Um, and some of the, some of the targets you're setting do become kind of fundamental to the business. We have a, uh, on our sustainability linked, um, portfolio project portfolio uh, vessel financing we have for example a uh, sustainability linked charter target 
So creating uh, charters with our customers that have a sustainability link where depending on how they perform um, emissions wise with the vessels, they get a, a, a bump up or a bump down in the rate that they pay, um, which, which brings it kind of right into the core of the business. So I would definitely say so. Yeah. Interesting how it, you, you can basically, you can basically see it on, on several levels in the, um, in, in the business models so, uh, or, or in, the, in the business. Um, and you, you, you also, of course, have been involved a lot on, on the sustainability linked bonds. Um, any thoughts on the on the KPIs from your side? Yeah, I, I think as discussed, that, that, that really, and that's the beauty, I call it, of sustainability linked bond structures is that it can you fit the structure and the KPIs to the actual business and the business model. But I would say that. Um, you know, putting together a standard um, sustainability linked uh, framework is not really that time consuming, but, but what is a little bit time consuming, again, depending on the business model, is to find the right KPI and the targets. So I, I would actually um, um, recommend uh, every company that uh, is uh, thinking of uh, accessing the capital markets to uh, do that sort of exercise internally, try to find, um, uh, you know, KPIs and structure that could work. And at least uh, because it, it's um, it's not something you do two days before you go to the market. It certainly takes a little bit of time, and uh, and thinking and discussion uh, discussions internally. Um, and, but you know, putting everything down on paper that's not really the, the biggest part of us. It's really to find the right structure. Also, I would say that, um, and this is uh, you know naturally also from an investor point of view, I think. One thing is the KPI and that you put a, a sustainability link stamp on the deal. That's, that's good, uh, but it's not uh, necessarily enough. It's really also about the ESG profile and the strategy of the company. And investors, uh, despite it being, uh, call it, uh, signed off by Sustainalytics or DNV or uh, Cicero or someone else, Investors really dig into the details about the ESG profile and, and uh, strategy and, and plans of the company and issue. So it's um, it, this is not like um, uh, call it a sort of light touch uh, new thing that just uh, sort of greenwash everyone and, and uh, just uh, go to the market and raise a lot of capital. You, you really need to have a, a good pl- a good plan, a good strategy, and uh, do uh, some meaningful. Um, uh, you know, uh, measures really to improve your uh, ESG uh, sustainability profile. So um, it's, um, it, and, and that's why I said earlier that it's a product in the making, because I think this is just the beginning. Uh, I think as, uh, as others said that um, over the next few years, I think we will see more sustainability linked and green uh, type of uh, assurances, but uh, it may be with a different uh, structure because that, the requirement from the investor market um, develops and, and I think everyone is, which is really the intention, everyone is moving in the right direction. So what's ambitious today may not be as ambitious in, in two or three years. So there will be um, a continuous development, I think, of this. Sounds like uh, sound advice to, to do some homework uh, on, on this side on uh, fr- from, the, from the company's perspective. Achilles, uh, any thoughts on, on this from, uh, from, from Gaslog on the ESG side? Uh, I was partially covered, but I would like to, to make some uh, observations. First of all, at Gaslog, ESG is very important. So you know, it, it goes with our investments in our own assets and uh, you know, the latest technology uh, vessels on the LNG, uh, that it is uh, definitely uh, an environmental friendly uh, fuel. Uh, the observations I wanted to make have to do first with the market, which um, uh, obviously the the naughty high yield market was able to to be innovative and be one of the first markets that um, attract that type of issuances. And uh, based on our experience and the, you know, uh, how we follow the markets, we have not really seen uh, so strong interest in Asia or in the US on uh, sustainability linked um, uh, issuances. So uh, this, the credit goes to, to the uh, Nordic market that um, has been um, open and innovative. So this is uh, a positive. Now, uh, on the other side, I do expect that uh, this sustainability uh, linked um, 
uh, idea, as my colleague said here, that it will develop further. The KPIs probably will become harder. And probably with the regulations uh, coming on the shipping, uh, you know, things may be a bit more complicated in the future. So um, it has been uh, an interesting uh, introduction, but I expect to, to develop uh, quite fast uh, for everybody. So going back to the comment that it really has to go with the core of the, of the business and how you operate instead of really trying to fix something on the size of the pricing of your phone. Yeah, no, it, it, I, uh, it, I agree. It, uh, it definitely is, is something to think about. Uh, Matt, um, any, before we leave the ESG side of things, any, any um, ESG challenges from, from your perspective? Yeah, I think, uh, I think perception is a big challenge that, that the industry faces and a lot of industries faces as people focus more on ESG. So you have, you know, 90% of global trades through the sea, but there's per this perception that, for example, the batteries being carried by the container ships are zero emissions while the vessel itself is not. So I think there needs to be a more pragmatic approach uh, and appreciation of transition solutions and the end-to-end -end transport supply chain rather than just the end product. So you have um, a carbon-rich, you know, supply chain that gives you these you know, a battery or an end product that's viewed as green, but there needs to be um, a, appreciation that transition of that of that transport supply chain is is valued um, just as equally as you know an electric vehicle or some other uh, green labeled product would be. Yeah. No, that's it. It is. Uh... Definitely uh, a lot of things to think about when it comes to both the ESG sustainability link and, and it is developing and it and, and it won't won't go away that, that's for sure so so there a lot of lot of interesting things to uh, to follow going forward um, I, we're we're um, we're shortly coming to the end of our session but I, I I thought in the end we should talk a little bit about uh, the fact we we talked about initially that currently there is a there's a good sentiment in in the market, and uh, and Nils, what what sort of uh, what's what's the basis for the, uh, the the economical side of things, and uh, and why this might be a good time to 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 get deals done. Well, I mean, uh, uh, as earlier said, the the uh, the oil market is is uh, is definitely good. You know, the the credit market is extremely strong. We've seen that uh, both in the in Norway, but also in the U.S. with the record amount of issues. Um, in terms of, of shipping, um, at least you know, we are Clarkson's are look at fuel shipping going forward uh, very favorable. Um, uh, as you say, we the the, the shipping uh, or the world is uh, it doesn't have enough shipping, as it says, all right. So, so uh, from a historical perspective, uh, the order books uh, on all segments are low. Um, no, it's basically as companies are not been ordering, uh, given uh, kind of the the uh, historical volatile market as well as as um, you know the uncertainty on the propulsion systems. So, so this, from our perspective, the earnings going forward is going to be elevated. And what does that cost? Well, it costs also that the the uh, the, uh, the, uh, the companies will uh, earn money and strengthen their balance sheet. So I think like going forward. Uh, uh, the market will stay uh, stay active, uh, and we think you know the, uh, the shipping companies will be well positioned to enter the market. Sounds good. Pierre, any any last uh, thoughts from? Uh, yeah, from just families? just to kind of sum up, uh, don't, and don't to deceive anyone on the uh, sustainability link or anything. The credit story needs to be uh, intact uh, anyway. That's the most important point, but it's definitely a, an important additional feature. And I would say also. Uh, at the, like the market is today, most public companies can utilize the market to do unsecured uh, debt, and uh, we can, uh, for even pre or private uh, ship owners, uh, secure deals can be structured as well. Uh, so, um, so there's um, anyone's looking for financing, uh, do not hesitate to to reach out. Yeah, I, I, Andreas, I would just add that um, obviously, uh, you know, being part of a, a lending bank as well, I would say 
that uh, clearly the trend over the last few years have been that the, uh, the, that the traditional banks have uh, less capacity or at least reduced their lending books to shipping uh, from, for, for various reasons. And the importance really of um, uh, shipping companies uh, accessing various and new, in many cases, uh, capital sources, I think is, is a trend that will continue. We've seen that with, um, uh, with leasing, uh, Chinese, Asian leasing, and other leasing type of structures, could be direct lending, and also the uh, the bond markets. Um, and uh, and I think, um, as discussed, the we are certainly in a very good environment right now, but um, experience from the past, and I think that will continue, is that uh, it is a volatile, shipping is volatile, and capital markets are volatile, and you really need to be prepared and, and tap the market when when the window is open and not uh, sit and wait and, and in many cases you need to raise the money when you don't need it basically so um, if you uh, if you are prepared and uh, also do your homework on ESG and the time the markets uh, I think your shipping companies will be in a good position to to raise uh, raise capital sounds uh, sounds very good um I think that's uh, that's the end of our session. It's been a really interesting discussion. Uh, thank you to all the panelists. Thank you for those who, who joined us to to listen today. It's uh, it's been great. I, I, as a last comment from my side, I must say that you know the the combination of of, uh, of the developments in the in the shipping market in and uh, and what needs to happen in shipping generally and uh, within the ESG and also the the capital markets and particularly the the Norwegian bond market. It's definitely interesting times to come. So. Um, we look forward to that and, and the development and to discuss that on a, on a later panel. But for now, thank you from all of us for, for listening today and, uh, and have a good rest of your day. Thank you. From me too. Thank you to all of you.